Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tatiana Domlaskaya. I'm the regional director of uh, uh, Vancouver chapter. Um, today we are online together from uh, a number of different countries for the event that is not very usual for our organization, as you know. Uh, therefore, I really appreciate your curiosity and time um, and hope you all will enjoy the show. I have to admit uh, that I am, as the Russian, as curious about this presentation as you are, because the question, why Russians don't smile, have been following me since May 1992, when I was uh, involved with the first American delegation visited my hometown of Yekaterinburg soon after it was opened for international visits. Uh, Westerners uh, were a big question mark for us that period of time and wondering of what do they think about Russia, I asked for their first impressions and the answer was quite unexpected. Russia is an amazing country, but why do you think Russians don't smile? How many times since then I've heard the same statement and uh, was always keen to understand this perception. So when two months ago I ran at Lincoln into our very special and distinguished member, Mr. Luke Jones, and he shared the news about his new book under the title, Why Russians Don't Smile. I thought, okay, finally, we've got the chance to resolve the questions. So this is how the, we decided to make this event happen. And according to the number of people attending the session today, it appears to be that I am not the only one who are puzzled by the subject. Before we begin the presentation, we would like to do some household comments. Our event uh, has two parts, presentation and interactive discussion. And to help you to get the most out of this event, I would like to ask our Zoom professional, Julia Dengina, to do very few um, technical explanations. I pass it on to you, Julia. Thank you, Tatiana. Hello, everyone. As Tatiana said, my name is Julia, and I'll be the event host today. Please note that the event is being recorded. And we're holding this event in Zoom meetings format. And as you probably noticed, we muted all the participants to avoid the background noises. However, we would like to make this event as interactive as possible. So you're all invited to ask your questions. To make sure that multiple people don't speak at the same time, we offer you two options to ask your questions, verbally or in written form. If you would like to ask your question verbally, please use Zoom function that is called raise hand. Let's all try this function right now so you can confirm that you can see and hear me well. To do so, please click participants on the bottom of your screen. This will open up a window and at the bottom of that window, there is a button called raise hand. Click on it if you can see and hear me well. Okay, I see a lot of you already found it. Great. So uh, when your turn comes to ask a question, uh, the moderator will call your name and I'll unmute your computer and you will be open to speak. This will allow you not only to ask a question, but also have a discussion with Luke Jones. Uh, if you don't want to go live, you can ask a question in written form. Uh, just simply use a chat box located at the bottom of your screen and make sure to type your full name and your question. Our honorable moderator, His Excellency John Sloan, will ask Luke the question on your behalf. Also, we'll be holding two polls during the event to get your feedback and insights. The results of these multiple choice questions, ergo polls, will be shared with you right away. Please note that all the answers are anonymous. And another important thing I have to mention is that your screen setting can be set up to speaker mode or gallery mode. We recommend you use speaker mode to better see active speakers and presentation slides. You can change the mode in the top right corner of your screen. If you have any questions, please message me directly and I'll be happy to help you. If you wish, you can do so privately in the chat box by clicking send to and choosing server. In brackets, it's going to say host. 
And that would be it from my side. Thank you. And I'm passing the word back to Tatiana. Thank you, Leah. I uh, hope this was not too complicated. Uh, well, now it's time to begin uh, the show. And I would like to introduce our first speaker uh, for the brief welcome remarks, uh, the founder of our association and the chair of uh, Mos uh, Serva Moscow chapter. I'm now giving you Nathan Hunt. Nathan. Thank you, Tatiana. Uh, I can just say it's a privilege to share the stage with Luke Jones. Uh, anybody who knows Luke knows he has uh, an absolutely uh, contagious character. Uh, uh, he is full of enthusiasm, energy, uh, and uh, I must say experience, certainly uh, uh, a more than 20 year experience in the Russian Federation. And I've considered it uh, a privilege to work alongside him for many of those years. Uh, he is uh, brought up in the UK, but he was born in Canada. Uh, his uh, mother is uh, Quebecois. He speaks uh, Quebecois, I believe, uh, French with a Quebecois accent. Uh, my French isn't good enough to tell the difference, unfortunately. <laughs> I'm embarrassed to say. Uh, but uh, I do know that Luke has been a tireless participant and contributor to serve as activities and its success since he joined our board of directors in Moscow probably 15 years ago, maybe more. Uh, and it's been an absolute pleasure to work with him. Uh, I've written the forward to his book actually in the middle of the pandemic where the, the mood was a little less euphoric. Uh, but suffice it to say that uh, uh, the, the title Why Russians Don't Smile is of course just a provocative one to get your interest. Russians of course do smile. Uh, but uh, uh, you know the, 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 the guidebook uh, could perhaps more properly be entitled uh, how to do business with Russia, how to understand the Russians on their own terms, or something like that. Um, I'm pleased that Luke has uh, seen fit to present the book to a wide Serba audience. I think if uh, any of you uh, have time, uh, you should uh, make time to read the book because it's full of uh, juicy, uh, fun insights, and it's very easy to read. It's, uh, it's, uh, you can certainly read it in bits and pieces. So thank you, Luke, for contributing this to literature, and we look forward to, to hearing, uh, hearing your remarks. Uh, I will now turn it over to the official moderator of the session, my good friend uh, and former ambassador to the Russian Federation of Canada, uh, His Excellency John Sloan. John, it's been a pleasure. It was, it was a pleasure to work with you in Moscow 10 years ago. I hope you're doing well in uh, Vancouver, or is it Victoria, where you are? Uh, and I'll turn the floor over to you. Okay, thank you, Nathan. Um, in fact, it's West Kelowna. Uh, there you have it. Canada's a lifestyle center, but also I think the uh, greatest region in the country for growing Chardonnay grape. Um, as Julia mentioned, um, um, uh, we're going to be doing a poll at the beginning of this uh, session and at the end. So um, uh, I think, uh, Julia, you can begin the process of, of polling. Uh, secondly, for those who um, uh, would like to verbally ask a question, um, 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 would you please identify yourself before you actually ask your question? Uh, third, I note that Luke is in Salahard. Uh, Salahard was actually one of my first trips uh, in Russia and the first time I had ever been um, uh, north of the uh, Arctic Circle. And I think Salahard is, is a great background for this discussion because in Salahard, there is a Canadian hockey arena. There are Canadian houses. And in Salahard, CETA had a program working with the indigenous Nanets people to uh, uh, raise their ability to process reindeer meat so that it could be exported into the European Union. So there are a lot of Canadian connections with Salahard and things that we, we, we shouldn't forget. So uh, I don't want to say too much. Um, uh, you can read uh, Luke's bio in the book. I would just note that he first visited uh, the Soviet Union in, in 1991, uh, went on to get a degree in, in Russian and Soviet studies, uh, came back to Moscow in 95, 96, uh, working on the Moscow Motor Show, uh, spent a fair bit of time in Eastern Europe, um, um, uh, and, and most recently joined uh, Furcroft in 1919 
as the regional uh, sales director for the CIS countries. Um, he has traveled extensively throughout uh, 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 both uh, Russia and the uh, CIS region. And certainly, um, uh, as Nathan noted, uh, is one of the most uh, uh, enthusiastic and perceptive members of Serba and certainly keeps everybody on their toes. Um, Luke's book deals with stereotypes and, 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 and much of what he's writing is, is um, uh, as I think he himself put it, uh, myth busting. Um, um, there are a lot of stereotypes out there, generalizations, uh, some of which have a, a kernel of truth in them, uh, some of which are, are, are basically just myths. Um, but um, um, Luke tries to uh, address them head on, and I think we can have a very interesting and provocative discussion. Um, I would also note that Luke doesn't shy away from, from difficult issues such as corruption in, in his book. And I think his, his extensive experience in, in, in Russia and Eastern Europe um, uh, allows him to deal with these issues in a, a forthright and, and straightforward manner. So uh, without any further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Luke. And uh, once we get into the Q&A session, I will do the best that I can to uh, moderate um, uh, and make sure that everybody can ask their question. Um, uh, and in the meantime, I would ask everybody to quickly fill out the, the beginning of the presentation poll. And remember, we're gonna have uh, a, a poll at the very end. So uh, let me turn it over to Luke and, and um, uh, it's all yours. Thank you very much, John. Really good to see you again. Um, yeah, I'm up on the Arctic Circle. Uh, uh, Salehard, um, and hope the, hopefully the internet connection will hold out here. Um, yeah, just to add to uh, what Nathan said, my, uh, my father's British, he emigrated to Canada in the 60s. Um, my parents actually met over in the resort in Banff, um, uh, but they got married in Montreal. Mum's from Quebec, so, but I went to high school in Britain, so I speak English with an English accent, parle français avec un accent québécois, and so um, it's pretty much uh, three countries that uh, I'm uh, uh, affiliated with. Um, I calculated recently that I've, I've actually spent half my life now uh, living and working in Russia. And I think that Russia is actually one of the most misunderstood countries in the world. Uh, I think to begin with, the reason for this misunderstanding is because as Westerners, we tend to think, hey, Russians look like we do, therefore they should you know, behave and act uh, and think like we do. And when they don't, we think to ourselves, hey, you know, why not? Uh, so as John said, I thought to myself, I found myself uh, when speaking with people who are new to Russia, I found myself answering the same questions over and over again. Why do Russians do this? Why don't they do that? And the biggest stereotype of all, why don't they smile? Now, of course they do, but this is why I decided to write the book here. Uh, uh, there is an online version that uh, um, but what I wanted to do was just to begin with a very brief presentation, um, just talking about some of the differences between Russia and the Western world. Uh, I think there should be an awful lot more synergies between Canada and Russia. I mean, let's face it, this is the largest and the second largest country in the world. The climate and terrain are pretty similar. We both love hockey, uh, but there aren't as many connections as there should be. So as Tatiana said, and Yulia said, I do want to make this, I don't want this just to be a Luke monologue. I like it when you ask questions, uh, you know, maybe you don't agree with something I say and let's discuss it. So. Uh, Oh yeah, and don't forget to fill in the poll. Uh, so there we go. There we go. Nope, doesn't like this. You are sharing screen. Looks good now. Why is it not doing anything? Ah, there we go. Right now, I got this off the internet. Uh, this actually came. Uh, um, this is about the USA, not Canada, but kind of sums up, uh, you know, commies 
Yeah, well, communism ended 30 years ago, but there's still this impression that, uh, hey, you know, uh, everybody's communist. Well, uh, funnily enough, no. Um, now, uh, again, uh, I love the ones for the Central Asian countries. Um, now, if we go on to the next part, uh, a lot of people have an impression of sort of what's Russia. Uh, it's always cold. Well, these are the mountains down on the border between uh, Russia and Kazakhstan. And Kazakhstan, by the way, where Serbia has a chapter, uh, is the ninth biggest country in the world. So, uh, and here's one. Uh, I'll be very curious to say if, if anybody knows where this is. This is also part of the former Soviet Union. This is the, probably the second most closed country in the world. It's Turkmenistan, the capital Ashgabat. I visited there a decade ago. Um, somebody said it reminds them, if you could imagine Dubai under communism. Uh, it also has the fifth largest gas reserves in the world. Um, there's one most people haven't been to. One of the uh, biggest differences I've found is that in Western society, uh, we tend to trust people straight away. I mean, you could meet a North American, maybe even a European, standing in line somewhere, and they'll tell you their life story within the first 30 seconds of you meeting them. Okay. But the analogy people use is the difference is a peach and a coconut. So North Americans will be like the peach, soft and smooth on the outside, but a tough nut to crack in the middle. It's just chit chat. Okay. But becoming close friends takes longer. Uh, Russians are more like the coconut. So, you know, tough on the outside. Okay. But once you become close friends, they'll do anything for you, like the inside of the coconut, nice and sweet. Um, one of the other things I've found is the thought process that Russians tend to make pretty spontaneous decisions, whereas we tend to make more, let's say, logical decisions. I had a German boss for many years, and the thought process with uh, many Northern Europeans is very, very pragmatic. Uh, so I found with Russians, it's more emotional and it can be sort of on the spot. Uh, it's unlikely that they'll think about it for months and then have a sort of solid plan. Um, one thing I noticed is that uh, when you meet a Westerner, typically the first question is, what's your name? And the second one is, where do you come from? And I've noticed that Russians are quite uncomfortable with this question. It comes back to a little bit to the trust because asking a Russian uh, that you've only just met, uh, sort of unsolicited information, like where are you from? And I can seal the thought process in their head like, you know, why do you want to know? Uh, you know, are you going to use this against me? And whereas in countries like Canada, USA, uh, in particular, sort of immigrant societies, it's much less about who you are. It's more about what can you do. Whereas it's changing a little bit in Russia, but where you came from did seem to be more important to people. Um, language. Okay. Now, we're used to using please and thank you. Okay, English can be a little bit wishy-washy. You know, would you be so kind as to open the window, please? Russian is a much more direct language. Okay, it's cut straight to the point. You know, do this, do that. Um, a, a Russian colleague asked me once, Luke, why do English speakers say not really when they actually mean no? And I thought, you know what, good point. Okay, um, it's a bit, on the other hand, you have like, you know, if a Japanese guy says, I will do my best, that probably means no. Okay, but with Russians, it's going to be yet. Okay, if it's if it's a no, but at least you know where you stand. It, you can, it, you know you can be taken aback a little bit to begin with, but you know there's no messing around. There's no wishy washiness. It's about you know if they're not interested, they'll tell you. So you can either think, okay, what do we need to do to make it interesting, or do we just forget it and move on? Now, that's one thing I've found here. Let me just move this down. Right, timekeeping. Um, now, in Russia, uh, there's a Russian expression, Piat minut nie which literally translates as five minutes doesn't constitute being late. Um, and I find it quite funny because many Russians have said, hey, look, okay, I joined the conference call a few minutes late, but I was talking to a customer. Come on, this can't be that bad. And then they complain and say, look, uh, you know, I, I was told that was highly unprofessional, but then my headquarters were three weeks late in dispatching a hundred thousand dollar order. Now, come on, you know, um, so 
it's uh, things happen more quickly, but there might be a slight delay to them uh, to begin with. Oops, where are we next one? Oh, there we go. Um, now, I put this slide in before the recent pandemic, uh, where people have been forced to work from home, because until then, having a home office in Russia was extremely unusual. Uh, whereas we're used to work being something that you do, and where you actually do it doesn't really matter so much. Um, work in Russia was very much a place you went to. Uh, it's where friendships are formed, relationships are formed, uh, you know, and it, you know, you'd often see that back home, you know, six o'clock, everybody heads home. Russians are much more likely to start slightly later, you know, have a cup of tea, have a chat with people, but they often work well into the evening. Now that can work in your favor, given the extensive time difference between Canada and Russia. Um, loyalty is another one that I've noticed that with uh, loyalty with Russians is often much more to the person than to the organization they work for. You know, I've read people's resumes where I say, hey, why did you only spend one year in that job? And it's like, oh, my boss jumped ship, went to another organization and took me with him, you know, took the whole team. Really? Okay, but sounds like you didn't have a choice. But it's like the loyalty was to the boss rather than to the, to the person. And Russians are highly loyal to people that are close to them. Okay, All right, there we go. And I think that's pretty much it. Yeah, that's pretty much it to begin with. Um, what I did want to touch on just before, so please do start asking questions now, but just before that, what I wanted to talk about was some of the um, questions I'm often asked, some of the main, uh, let's say, myths uh, and stereotypes about Russia, because the, the book is very much a myth buster. Uh, yes, there are some generalizations in here, but I didn't want the book to be too thick or nobody would read it. Uh, when people say to me, you know, what's Russia like? I've never been there. My typical straight and concise answer is whatever you've seen in the Western media, you know, or, or read in the paper about Russia, either ignore it or believe the opposite. Go there with an open mind and you will be pleasantly surprised. Okay, most people's reaction uh, upon arriving in Moscow or in Russia for the first time is usually like, wow, it's normal. I didn't think it was going to be like this. And I said, like, what did you think it was going to be like? Okay. And unfortunately, it's very rare that you will um, read a positive article about Russia in the newspaper, okay, or, or see a positive uh, um, report about Russia on TV. You know, why? I think partly as one uh, journalist, I think it's from the Globe and Mail, said, Luke, uh, you know, nobody wants to read about the trains running on time, okay? People want to read about, uh, you know, the Russian mafia trying to sell plutonium to Iran, or 50 people made uh, moonshine in a village in Siberia, and half of them went blind. You know, that's, that's news, okay? Um, so, you know, foreign journalists have an agenda, I also think Russia doesn't always do itself any favors. I think the Kremlin likes this sort of tough guy image that we're this big, horrible, cold country, and if people aren't uh, frightened of us, they won't respect us, and it kind of meets in the middle. But to sum up, come in with an open mind, uh, and yeah, you'll, uh, you, you'll, you'll be very surprised. There's, there's also the expression that foreigners cry twice. First time when they hear that they're being posted to Russia, and second time when they hear that they have to leave, okay? Um, also, you know, is it, is it really cold? Well, it's pretty similar to Canada. Yeah, it's cold in winter, it's hot in summer, and short spring and fall. Um, we often hear like, you know, do you have to drink heavily to do business in Russia? Well, uh, you know, yeah, there's not too many abstainers, but it's unlikely you're gonna be drinking vodka first thing in the morning, you're probably going to drink more with your fellow expatriates or uh, traveling companions than with Russians. Uh, yeah, there's, you know, there's a bit of drinking, but uh, you know, let's pretend that we don't all enjoy a glass from time to time. Um, you know, again, one of the other issues we've been dealing with uh, uh, at, here at Serba has been sanctions. 
a lot of companies we found unfortunately will self-sanction because they find that uh, oh there are sanctions on Russia you know we can't do business there well sanctions actually prevent very few things from happening uh, it's something worth exploring but um, you know most of the world's largest organizations offer, operate you know transparent businesses so the same goes for corruption is there is corruption an issue well in certain areas yes but you know um, big organizations big multinationals would not be here if it was not possible to run a clean you know business operation okay so those are the main points uh, to begin with just finally why did i call the book why russians don't smile well i find that the simple answer to this is that russians do smile but whereas westerners will smile more to make the person in front of them feel comfortable and at ease russians won't do this russians will smile only if they are genuinely happy okay and again uh, if you you know i've had people say hey i went to north america and people were asking me you know how are you doing I thought, oh, wow, you know, they're, they're so interested in how I'm doing. And I said, no, that just means hi. Okay. If a Russian, if you said to a Russian, how are you doing? They think you're genuinely interested in. And so expect a long reply and don't expect it to be like, you know, awesome, uh, unless it really is. So whereas Russians will say the sort of North American, you know, have a nice day with a big smile, they say it's fake. Okay. So if someone does smile, then they really mean it. Even Yulia smiles, and Tatiana as well. Delighted. Um, so maybe I can turn back to John, and uh, we can kick off with a few questions. Okay, thank you, Luke. Um, now we get into the technical side, uh, and hopefully I will uh, be able to handle it. If you, the, the idea is to have a conversation with Luke. So uh, the preferred route is for you to raise your hand I will recognize you, and then Yulia will 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 unmute you. So um, uh, I've got a limited number of people, but I believe that if you press the raise your hand button, you should pop up on my participants list as somebody who has raised their hand. So um, uh, please, uh, if you have a question for Luke, start with that. The alternative is to type the uh, uh, question on, on the uh, chat button, and uh, I will then ask it on your behalf. There we go. So, Yulia, do you have anybody who has raised their hand? Uh, not yet. Here. Not yet. They will move to the top. Everybody seems shy. It's always like this, Yulia. Nobody wants to ask the first question. Um, and then as soon as someone does, then, uh, then okay, lots of questions well, come in. Let me start with the uh, uh, first question. Uh, Luke, uh, what is your best experience in, in Russia? And what is your worst experience in Russia? <laughs> um, good point. I could sum that up by saying that um, I think one of the examples, like when I first came to, to Russia, I found that... Uh, you know, doing basic things. Uh, so back in the 90s, when there was no internet, if you wanted to buy, um, you know, a ticket to ride on and buy a ticket, uh, you, you know, you couldn't uh, reserve a hotel room by going online, you had to actually go into the hotel. And I found that, you know, this was doing basic things was complicated, you used to get sort of like, you know, we got no tickets. Uh, and the carriage was empty or like, you know, yes, yeah, the hotel's full and it was empty. Um, and I found that, you know, this was quite frustrating because I thought, do these people want to bribe? And then I realized, no, they just, you know, customers are, were a nuisance. They didn't really care whether you were there or not. I mean, there's a hangover from the Soviet days. And this took a lot of getting used to. Uh, the fact that there just was a complete lack of service culture. Um, now this has improved a lot in, in recent years. But on the other hand, uh, what I found is that, uh, you know, I can remember struggling to get, a, get on a train, you finally managed, um, and you were going to a different city and people would befriend you on the train and say, hey, you know, share our food, you know, ha uh, have a beer with us and where are you staying? You don't have anyone to stay, oh, come and stay with us. Now, 
if you think about it, in Canada, everything is sort of nicely boxed up. Okay, nobody's going to yell at you for the fact that you wanted to buy a ticket to ride on the train. Okay, but it's pretty unlikely someone's going to go out of their way to let you stay, uh, <laughs> you know, in their home when they just met you on public transport. You know, unless you're extremely attractive. Uh, so I found that you've got to be prepared for extremes. Okay, uh, which we're often not used to. So it can go either way. Um, but in terms of the the most so. I think it was just the difference in mentality um, to begin with, that you thought, why is it that the same person, when they see you in a, in a setting where they don't know you, could, could be so rude, but the same person, you know, uh, in a personal situation can, can be just the opposite and will do anything for you. Whereas with us, it's all straight down the middle. Okay. Um... Still see no questions, at least nobody raising their hand. So I've got a second question for you. Um, during my time in Moscow, I argued uh, constantly that given the extremes of climate, given the extremes of distance, uh, given the, the fact that uh, between Russia and Canada, we have 75% of the Arctic coastline, um, and given that both countries are very much uh, uh, dependent on natural resources, there should be an awful lot more trade between the two countries. Um, why, in your mind, has this not happened? Um, it's a difficult one. We've been sort of pondering this one for a long time at Serba. I think um, the... Partly, I mean, I'll, I'll start with sort of the most obvious one is the um, the, the negative uh, image of Russia. And I've still never worked out really why, you know, the, the media is, uh, is so negative. But unfortunately, back in the 90s, when it was more difficult to do business, you there were some horror stories about foreigners who'd had their business appropriated, um, you know, by the, maybe not mafia, but by their Russian partners. And unfortunately, those were the kind of things that stuck. And there is still this impression that it's dangerous. You can't do business there. Um, I think that's partly it. Um, again, if you look at you know, Canada and where does Canada export, 80% of all Canadian exports go to one country. Uh, you know, that big one, or sorry, that, uh, that uh, smaller one, but more populous one called the USA. And I think the perception is that there are easier places to do business you know on the continent you've got the whole of uh, central and latin america you know go west and you've got china and india go east you've got the european union and for some strange reason russia doesn't get much of a look in um and it's one that we've never really cracked i mean we've done um you know let's say uh, we've tried you know doing positive pr let's say back in canada and for some reason People seem to think that it's just easier to do business elsewhere. Although I typically say that probably the best thing about doing business in Russia is the lack of competition. You know, Russians regularly say to me, you know, Luke, why do you live in Russia and not, you know, Europe or North America? And I say, look, back home, you know, if you're lucky, there'll be 10,000 people doing the same thing as you. If you're unlucky, it's 100,000 or more. In Russia, there is a lot less competition uh, and, you know, it's an open field. I've just found it a lot easier to go in and meet top level people than it is in most other countries. Uh, so it, generally, the people that you meet who are doing business in Russia, um, you know, are, are do it very successfully. Now, again, it, it's not all good news. I'll be about that. Uh, I would say the bureaucracy is probably more of an issue than, uh, and, you know, than corruption. Uh, a lot of foreign companies find that corruption is more about uh, Russians embezzling from the state budget rather than if you're trying to sell something or produce something in Russia, you're much less exposed to it. So it is largely a perception issue. Um, so I do say to people, you know, come on over, see it for yourself. Don't just talk to people working for a multinational. Talk to an expatriate who's running his own business. Uh, you know, come and talk to us at Serba. Okay. 
Um, I have a question here from Sertak uh, Yenner, um, who says, good day. Uh, which Twitter or YouTube accounts would you recommend to follow the daily business and political life in Russia? Um, I'll be honest, I'm not a big Twitter fan. Um, I, I found that there's, you know, it's... Uh, um, too much sort of inconsequential junk on there that uh, and, and it's sort of a bit toxic. But for vloggers, um, if you want to see something a bit out of the ordinary, there's a guy called Bald and Bankrupt, okay? Uh, he's a Brit and he travels around some pretty weird parts of the country. He doesn't just go on Red Square and go around Moscow. You know, he travels to strange parts of Russia. He goes to Belarus, Ukraine, uh, you know, all around the former Soviet Union. And his Russian's pretty good. And he sort of bumps into random people, has a shot of vodka with them, takes public transport. He's got a lot of clips that are sort of 10, 20 minutes long. And he shows what it's really like. So that's sort of for everyday news. Um, there's the old fashioned, John, you might remember the Moscow Times from when you were there. Oh, yeah. um, uh, <laughs> um, that's still a pretty you know, a, a good source of information, I found. There are a number of other sites. I would also recommend that, uh, you know, you can go on to Facebook and there are a number of, uh, let's say, groups, like you have things like expats in Moscow, expats in Kazakhstan. Um, there are a number of, and then just follow through those and you can, you can pick up a lot about what's going on. Okay. I now have three uh, uh, verbal questions and one written question. Um, I now have four verbal questions. I knew this uh, would happen. <laughs> uh, Yulia, could we begin with Igor Smirnov? Hi. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Hi, Igor. Uh, hello, Luke, how are you? Yeah, doing well, thanks. Uh, listen, I applaud your the efforts that uh, the, the server does as an organization the book is great i haven't read it but i mean the title it sells um it, is, it exists uh, i would uh, well <laughs> i'd love to see it in a digital format perhaps and but uh to the point i i think um this could be arguably a, a server should uh maybe you know start doing a strategy what what is as an organization, you guys, you're trying to educate. You're talking a lot about propaganda, Western propaganda, perhaps not um, uh, praying Russia uh, properly. But the, uh, one of the goals for Serbia is education, and uh, on both sides. A book like this, uh, fantastic. And perhaps there are other, uh, I'm sure there are organizations similar to you in other countries. So wouldn't it make sense? Do you think that this could be... That, uh, should become more of a, a goal for server do these um i mean becoming that more of an educational thing like what, what in practical terms what can you do as organization as individuals who are clearly passionate about Russia, about people there but seeing this shared for us that a lot of us have well where that should and make sense to uh, to act as, as businesses they don't happen uh, th thank you, Igor. I mean, uh, what I find, uh, I mean, what I say to people who show up in Russia for the first time, um, and, you know, as I said, the first comment is always like, wow, it's normal. I didn't think it was going to be like this. Um, I always say, you know, I'm delighted that you enjoyed your stay. Now do me a favor and go back to your home country and tell everybody you know, friends, family, you know, whether you came on business or just for pleasure, Say, I went to Russia and it was great. It was normal, okay? And you're right, it's educational. I mean, for example, we had the Soccer World Cup here uh, two years ago, okay? And uh, a lot of the international media, uh, and again, Britain was particularly guilty of this, just went into overdrive. And I was called up because I've been to previous tournaments. You know, I, I was in Ukraine, Brazil, South Africa, France, and, you know, I had journalists call me up saying, you know, uh, are we going to, you know, when we land at the airport, you know, are we going to be beaten up as soon as we uh, leave the arrivals? Are we going to 
be, who's going to beat us up first, the, the Russian police or the, or, or the Russian soccer fans? Uh, you know, is it safe to ride on the metro? Like, guys, it's going to be fine. But of course, you know, that's not going to sell any papers. Okay, so as I said, so yes, it's educational. Now, one of the things we do at Serba is we link up with many of the other business organizations. So uh, one of the other big ones is the AmCham, the American Chamber of Commerce. We do events with, with the Brits, with the, uh, the French. Um, you know, we, we even have, uh, we've done business, you know, with the Polish Business Association. So a lot of other ones with the Indians even. So we're all in this together. And it's an uphill battle. So, it, it, it look, so look, if I, if I may just finish, it's a question slash uh, really an offer. Um, as you know, Press Reader does work globally. And we deal with actual with, with propaganda in, in a matter of speaking of different countries and whatnot. But um, uh, look at it closer. As we, perhaps pieces of the book part of, of uh, what we do. Uh, as you know, we, we deal with media. Um, Moscow Times was uh, until it was still in print. It was still part of the network. Uh, as we're in mo multiple countries, this could be a piece of you know positive propaganda that. Um, could reach uh, desirable yeah, sure. audiences. Anyway, thank you. No, thank you. Uh, Tatiana, I'm sure we'll happily put you in touch. I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, you know, I'm pretty easy to find. I have a, an unusual name because it's a sort of a French-English combination. So uh, I, I think Luke Jones well, look, is look, and Igor Smirnov. <laughs> I look for it. Well, <laughs> so please, please do LinkedIn. get in touch. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay, next I have both a written question and a spoken question from Gregory uh, Pokorny, uh, if he could be unmuted. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, um, yeah, I just wrote in the, in the comment box, I just wanted, or in the chat box there, I just wanted to know if you could just uh, make a few comments about, uh, com uh, about comparison in Russia, like it's a very big country like Canada is. Um, I mean, comparing, I guess, urban compared to rural and then different regions in Russia. I mean, you have the Western part, Central, Siberia, Far East. Any differences, comments about, about the different parts within Russia? Yeah. But thanks, Grigori. Um, what you find is, I think the, the biggest uh, difference between say, Canada and Russia is the fact that uh, in Canada, you know, you have each provincial capital um, that that it, so it's very decentralized. Russia is much more um, centralized. It's a very top-down system, just like in the government or in any big Russian organization. So essentially, you have Moscow, uh, where you know everything starts. Uh, then you have uh, so that's where power is concentrated. Then you have St. Petersburg, which obviously is where Mr. Putin comes from. So uh, that's a pretty significant uh, city. Then you have about 15 cities of around about a million people, and then you have everything else. Uh, now, a lot of the natural resources are in remote places, just like they are in Canada, um, but the decisions for a lot of these things are still made in Moscow. So, you know, even if you're in sort of Northeastern Russia, uh, you only need to look at flight schedules that everywhere will have a flight to Moscow, even if it's nine hours away so whatever it is you're digging up um you know you will still find you're having to, you're having to deal with, with with moscow urban rural are huge differences that uh you know people come to the middle of moscow and say hey i've been to russia and i said no you've been to downtown moscow okay um you go literally 50 miles outside of moscow and it's a different world um you know and there's huge inequality between life in the sort of downtown big cities and then you know, out in the villages. Uh, it, it's, it's unbelievable for a country that um, when they had communism was trying to show that everybody was equal. Okay, they weren't. Uh, but now um, I heard a statistic that 80% of foreigners who come to Russia only ever visit Moscow or St. Petersburg. And I can believe that. Uh, it's changing especially with the World Cup and the Olympics. But out of Moscow and St. Petersburg, um, even if you don't need to, to see what it's really like. 
it's a, it's a bit like going to downtown Toronto and saying, yeah, I've seen all of Canada. <laughs> God forbid. Okay, my <laughs> thank next you, thank uh, you. verbal questions from Alex Grishin of uh, Serba in Moscow. Hi, look, just one. Hi, Alex. Uh, just wonder, what is the usual comments from Russian people uh, you get uh, from, from those, uh, those Russian people who had the chance to read your book? Um, I think, I mean, I'll be honest, good point, Alex. Um, I have tailored the book slightly towards Russians a little bit more recently um, because Whenever, when I, I mean this, by the way, uh, guys, this is actually the fourth edition. I don't know if you can see that uh, down there. It says fourth edition. Um, when I wrote the first one almost eight years ago, it was, you know, primarily uh, written for foreigners uh, who were planning to come and live in Russia or do business with Russia. But many Russians said to me, like, "Oh wow, you know, we didn't, you know, we didn't think that it was, you know, strange that that's how you view us." And Russians are genuinely interested in what foreigners think about them. So I have tailored the book slightly. Um, I mean, most of the time, I think, uh, you know, I, I've, there's nothing negative in the book. Uh, I write about how it is. I don't say this is right or wrong, or this is good or bad. It's like, look, this is how it is. And I think in the West, we are guilty of thinking, look, this is the way we do things. Uh, this is the only way. And if you don't do it this way, you're wrong. Um, whereas it's not about that. I think, uh, you know, cultures can learn from each other, um, you know, and I think, as I said, it's, it's a point of education for all of us that there isn't just a one way of, of doing things. Um, so I think most of the time, many Russians, especially those who work for international companies have said to me, Luke, you know, thank you. First of all, it's interesting for me to read, but we've been trying to explain to to our headquarters or, you know, regional hub that, you know, in Russia, it's different because of this, 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 and they don't listen. Uh, so we told them, hey, it's not us, read, the, you know, Luke's a, an expat, he's been here 20 years, read this, um, this will answer your questions. But one Russian guy uh, who was running a big uh, a US IT company said to me after the first book, he said, Luke, great book, but I think a lot of Russian, uh, sorry, a lot of foreigners will read the book and they will ignore all of the advice in the book because they still think that they're smarter. Okay. Uh, and he said like, don't be one of those. <laughs> okay. Um, next is a written question from John Little. Um, good evening. Uh, I often email people in the former CIS countries and can struggle to figure out their gender by their names in print. Are there any hacks for this? it would make the follow-up phone calls a little more comfortable for me to make. Yeah. Um, luckily, uh, I mean, this is a good point because I've said uh, there is actually a, a section in my book about names. Admittedly, it's more about Russian because uh, normally, if you think about it, in Western societies, we put our first name, then our last name, okay? Although I have the issue that uh, in my passport, I'm actually Douglas Luke Jones, and this can confuse Russians, um, but I've always been known as Luke. Now, Russians will sometimes uh, use their last name followed by their first name, and then they have a patronymic. Uh, now, usually, with Russia, it's a little bit easier because typically if the, if the first name ends in an A, it's nearly always uh, a lady. Okay, the exception, of course, is if, if a guy is called Nikita or Ilya. Okay, so there's a few exceptions. That's just to keep you on your toes. The difficulty comes when you start going to places like Kazakhstan, okay? Um, now, I've had this as well, um, but again, uh, a lot of Kazakh names, you know, or Uzbek names for females will end in A, but not all of them, okay? Um, the way to work out if it's a first name or a last name, again, um, is to uh, is to look at uh, a, a lot. Sorry, a lot of names in former Soviet Union have been Sovietized, so they will end in you know Yev, Yeva. Probably the easiest way to do it is to put the put the name into LinkedIn. Okay, just put the name in and hit return, and you'll get 
you know, 10 people coming up with that name. Look at the photo and see, you know, is that a girl or a dude? Easiest way, because uh, there is a is. Because I found this in first name, but for foreigners, they sometimes turn it around. And we've had like, you know, um, please contact our human resources director, Wu Xu. And I'm like, ah, you know, which one? So it's a little bit easier, but I found LinkedIn, put the name in, uh, and, and that's, that's solved it, I think, 99% of the time. But you know what? Worst case, it's okay to ask. Okay. Okay, you know, my next uh, uh, Sorry, John. No. Uh, just one other thing on names. I mean, the issue I have is in um, having a French spelling of a name, Luc, um, with English speaking people and they see a list, they often, if they haven't seen my photograph, they think it's Lucy with the Y missing. Okay, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> anyway, sorry, John. Uh, no Carry on. Um, my next spoken question is uh, from Diana G. If we could uh, un unmute her. However, um, uh, we're getting to the end of our time, so perhaps Yulia could put our ending poll uh, up and people can respond to it. I still have more written questions, so Luke, if you can keep your answers as short as possible, um, um, uh, we will we will get through as many people as we can. So, Diana G. Hello, hello, everyone. Hello, Luke. Uh, thank you for colorful presentation. And uh, I'm a regional manager in uh, Press Reader. I look after Russian and, Russia and CIS region. So my uh, question will be uh, to you. Um, I know Russians are extremely visual and they prefer in-person communication to online or remote business. So how, how do you think how to attract Russians and connect with them on a remote basis? Uh, what would you, your advice will be here? Um, I mean, Russians are very well, uh, you know, are very connected. Um, and I've also noticed that, uh, you know, you can, uh, you can message a Russian at sort of 10 o'clock at night or, or uh, you know, on a Sunday afternoon, and they'll probably respond straight away, uh, which is great. You know, yeah. uh, you, try, you try calling up a French guy at, you know, quarter past six in the evening, and it'll be like, you know, oh, is this an emergency? What is the problem? You know, um, now, you don't get that with Russians. They will, they will probably respond. Um, again, the last few months has changed this tremendously uh, about the fact that people have, have learned to work from home. Um, so I've found that, uh, you know, generally Russians are extremely receptive to the internet. Just one point on social media. LinkedIn is formally blocked in Russia. Now, you can get around it with a simple VPN, but it's fallen out of favor a little bit. And people are using Facebook and Instagram for work. Now, this for us uh, is quite unusual because typically we keep Facebook for friends and family and we keep LinkedIn for work and there's a pretty big line down the middle. In Russia, it's all thrown into one. And I see people come here and they're like, uh, you know, they say, oh, I, you know, uh, suppliers and colleagues and partners are all adding me on Facebook. You know, I've got pictures of my wife and kids there. You know, should I be? I said, look, it's up to you, you know, who you choose to mix with. But in Russia, business, family life, it's all thrown into one. Um, how do attract Russians? I would say you need to have something like anywhere that is going to be of interest for them. Uh, now, as I said, I found that uh, Russians are genuinely interested in what outsiders think of them. Maybe that's as a result of the Soviet Union having been closed for 70 years. We couldn't get in. You couldn't get out. Um, so it was like sort of, you know, one big prison. There was just a complete lack of information. Uh, and now suddenly it's like we all want it. Um, so, you know, again, it's about content, having something that people want, um, you know, and something that, uh, you know, is, is going to attract them. I hope that partly answers oh, your question. Absolutely. Yeah, thank Thanks. you. Thanks. Okay, I've got, uh, we're going to run out of time, um, but uh, let me pose one more written question. And then I'll give Tatiana uh, the last word. Um, so uh, the written question is from Galaxy S9. Um, I'm afraid I, I don't know who that is. Um, <laughs> the question is, if you compare Russia, Kazakhstan, and Uzbekistan, 
which country is a better opportunity to do business and which country among the three is the easiest to do business with. Thank you. Thanks. Sir. Um, it depends on what your business is um, because Russia, obviously, uh, I mean, I was always told, look, um, if you know, percentage wise, Russia probably has over 80% of that market. Okay. Uh, Kazakhstan is probably five and Uzbekistan is probably about two, you know, and Ukraine is maybe another 10 and the rest of it is sort of, you know, half or 1% of it all. Now, Having said that, um, Uzbekistan has opened up very much recently. Serba have run several missions down there. Um, you know, the uh, current Canadian ambassador, um, Alison Leclerc, is also uh, accredited with Uzbekistan. And we've got, hopefully, when things open up, there's going to be a mission down there. Um, we also have, uh, you know, there's a Canadian embassy in uh, Nur Sultan, Kazakhstan, very, very active there. Um, so... What I would say is if you're going to go to Kazakhstan or Uzbekistan, they're much smaller markets, but there's considerably less competition down there. Um, Uzbekistan is completely new and they're doing their best to attract inward investment. Uh, but it's, it's, still, it's, it's still new. Kazakhstan is still very much uh, natural resources based, which again is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, but again, what I usually say is, look, start with Russia. It's easier. It's more established. It's slightly closer. Uh, and then expand into the other countries from there. But ultimately, without knowing what your business is, it's hard to give any, a precise answer. But just look at the population. You know, Russia has 142 million people. Kazakhstan has maybe 18. Uzbekistan is 30-something million. So, uh, you know, start with the biggest one and take it from there. Okay, thanks. I'm afraid that we are now out of time. Um, but let me turn to Tatiana for um, uh, a last question. And then, uh, Yulia, if you could, um, uh, I just see it's just come up, put up the, uh, the poll results. Uh, be interesting to see. Tatiana. Look, um, I have a question which is uh, kind of uh, very important for me because I left Russia uh, more than 15 years ago. And uh, as far as I understand, uh, you came to Moscow sometimes in the 90s, right? Yeah. And uh, right now, comparing to 90s, uh, what is the most important change in the country? I'm not talking about how it uh, changed visibly. I'm uh, talking about how it's changed emotionally, mentally. And uh, what do you think uh, are the good changes and what are the bad changes to you as the person who is living there for what, more than 20 years? Yeah, thank, thank you, Tatiana. Yeah, I first showed up when I was at high school in, in 90, February 91. And I remember going into stores and there was literally nothing to buy. Um, I mean, again, visibly, it's, you know, it's completely changed. I'd say probably the biggest change is the fact that you've gone in 30 years from a society where literally making money, you know, buying something, you know, buying this phone, well, they didn't exist then, but buying anything at one price and selling it for a profit. 30 years ago, you would have gone to jail for that. Okay, uh, you know, that was what evil capitalists did. You know, I mean, people have actually said to me, like, you know, in the 90s, you know, was it, is it moral? to buy things at one price and sell them, you know, uh, with, a, with a markup, you know, <laughs> at a profit. And I said, well, actually, that's the basis of our entire economy. And people were just, you know, shocked at that. Um, and obviously, you know, people have embraced this in the last, uh, not everywhere, um, but essentially, people used to sh receive a paycheck for showing up to work. People now realize that they have to take responsibility for themselves. You know, previously, the government made most of the decisions for you. It was a, largely a cradle to the grave system where you were guaranteed, not a lot, but it was guaranteed there. Whereas now, uh, you know, suddenly from not needing to earn money, you, you got a paycheck, you showed up at work, you did, did what you needed to do. Overnight, suddenly you had to start earning money. You only need to look at the difference uh, in Russian language that... In English, you would say, how much do you earn? In Russian, you know, how much do you get? How much do you receive? 
Um, and this for me is the biggest change that people understand that, you know, it doesn't happen automatically. You know, you've actually got to go out there and do something that somebody wants. Now, there's still a long way to go. Uh, again, this is not amongst everyone, but what I like most of all is the younger generation who have never noticed, never witnessed communism. Um, they only know it from talking to their grandparents. Uh, you know, Russians don't like to be lectured, but they do like to learn. Uh, and, you know, I'm working for a staffing agency. I'm extremely fortunate that I get to meet some very bright people who really are keen to embrace changes and who want to, you know, better themselves and their country. So, uh, yeah, you know, uh, still very positive. There's a long way to go, but we'll get there. <laughs> Luke, thank you very much. Um, I note that uh, the poll um, from Yulia has 66% of people have a more positive view uh, after your presentation. So, uh, <laughs> and, and um, the other 33% just didn't change, but uh, I think you can take that as a- We've got a, some work to do. We've got, we got some work to do. Um, okay. can, can I just say thank you very much to everyone. Um, please do find me on LinkedIn. I mean, Tatiana hopefully will send out the link to the book directly. You know, that is, that is free. We, you know, don't try and find it on Amazon. It isn't there. We don't sell it. Um, you know, the, the, this is a, uh, an education campaign. Uh, the hard copies will be John Austin, the mail for you. Um, and uh, do find me on LinkedIn. And for the Russian speakers, just by the way, I do have a fortnightly column with the Russian language edition of Forbes magazine, where this is more for foreigners to understand Russia. And I turn it around and I write articles for Russians to understand how, um, let's say, how to do business, how to work better with foreigners. So I do it the other way around. It's in Russian. Um, so it's there. So please do find me on LinkedIn. Get in touch. Uh, if you've got any questions later on, you know, uh, please, please do message me. Okay. But thank you very much to everybody for listening. Uh, thank you, Luke. And my apology for apologies to those whose uh, questions were not posed to you. Uh, maybe they could email you directly. Uh, Tatiana, yes. do you have a, any final word? Thank you so much for moderation. It uh, usually uh, creates a little bit stressful kind of work. So thank you so much. <laughs> uh, Luke, um, I would like to greatly appreciate uh, this presentation. I'm very happy that we decided to do it and that we did it because uh, uh, this is something which we really uh, need to, to, to do more. Uh, to, to show people that you know Russia is not that scary a uh, huge <laughs> dark place, uh, uh, you know, it's uh, kind of uh, exciting in, in many ways and, uh, and I'm, I'm really grateful that uh, you um, have shown my, my whole co country from the very positive angle. Thank you so much. For no, thank everyone, you very much, thank everyone. Thank you uh, for, for, uh, for participation. If you need to connect with Luke, you can either find him uh, on LinkedIn uh, or you can connect to me or uh, my colleagues and uh, we will be happy to put you in touch directly with him. Uh, Thank you very so much. I, I would like to also appreciate our supporter, uh, Julia Dinkina, because without her, this all stuff would not be possible to, to implement because we are still not very literate in uh, Zoom stuff. So thank you, Julia, for uh, what you do for us. And uh, again, um, you know, I think uh, we should all look very uh, positive into the opportunity with Russia. And please, please read Luke's book. Thank you to all. Have a good, have a good day. Have a good evening, everyone. Everyone, and I'm just going to. Good morning share. for some. <laughs> John, Tatiana, Yulia, thank you very much, and Alex, Nathan. Take care. Okay. Good luck, Luke. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Take care. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Joy Salahard. <laughs> Thank you very much. We uh, actually, I'll tell you, um, John, just while we're here, a um, couple of days ago, I was in Vorkuta. Uh, and I have to say, um, you know, I'm, I'm generally extremely positive about Russia, you know, pretty much everywhere I go. But um, 
that was probably the worst place I've ever been. Uh, <laughs> I, I struggle to find, I mean, um, I don't know if you guys use Facebook at all or Instagram, but um, I put pictures on Instagram. If you go on to Facebook and find my post on there, uh, I post, you know, literally, I went to Chernobyl, uh, Pripyat, uh, 10 years ago, uh, just, just for a visit. And honestly, Vorkuta, for me, was like the town of Pripyat, which was abandoned in 1986, two days after the explosion. And Vorkuta was literally like Pripyat, but with a few people still living there. I honestly didn't realize there were still places in Russia where all the symbols on the factories, on the houses, were from the Soviet Union. Yeah. Um, it's probably got a quarter of its population left. You know, I've seen abandoned buildings uh, in Russia, but here you literally go one building back from the, the main street and, you know, it's just completely abandoned. It, it is just unbelievable. I've never seen anything like it. Well, Salahard is a way in gas. Um, and, uh, you know, so, uh, again, it's, it's a country of extremes. So, well, Salahad's not like that. <laughs> the heart is the yamal uh, uh, region, right? Yeah, I mean, basically, the difference is Vorkuta has coal, you know, Yamal has gas, okay? And uh, you can just see it that when we crossed over, we, we took the train yesterday when we had the, uh, the practice call and we were on the, on the train. And you just noticed that leaving Vorkuta and arriving in Labutnangi, Labanangi is just a little town with nothing in it, but it's got brand new housing blocks built. Um, you go into the, the grocery store and they sell sort of normal food. Uh, it's not just sort of semi-Soviet style products. You know, I mean, uh, they actually were selling sort of, you know, wok noodles, you know, Tabasco and sort of, you, you could actually have things that you, whereas there was, there was nothing like that in, in Vorkuta. Uh, and of course we crossed over into Salehad today and, we actually went past the ice rink. We went past the, uh, there's, a, um, there's a burger um, restaurant. Obviously it's closed at the moment with a, with a maple leaf on it. I was like, wow. <laughs> um, so hopefully things will open up a little bit here. But uh, you can see that the investment here is happening. And, and in Varkuta it isn't. Uh, but, um, you know, it's, so I, I'm, you know, I try to be positive about most places. Um, again, there's, you know, unfortunately, when Western journalists come here, they, ju they, they just try and find something bad. Um, you know, whereas you, you can find something bad about anything. Uh, I prefer to see something positive. Well, enjoy your we time probably, then. We probably need to, to make a trade mission to Hunter Mansi's autonomous district. I was there last yeah, I mean, time, Nathan, uh, we, about, uh, I don't know, six, seven years ago. We, 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 need to, we need to do more of this. Uh, I'm, I'm still a big believer in that uh, the best way to, uh, uh, you know, to promote places is to actually get people to see it for themselves. And it's the advice I always give to people. Whenever Russians say to me, like, oh, our head, I say, look, invite them here. And, you know, when they, when they come to Moscow or somewhere, don't just let them have dinner in the hotel restaurant. Take them out. Take them for a walk down, you know, even if you just walk them down a red square and so they can do a selfie on, uh, I say, look, you know, th there's no tanks going down the road. Nobody's shooting, you know, look, uh, um, take, take them to a restaurant, take them to a bar, walk them around, um, take them on the Metro for a ride. Um, I find that's the easiest way to, uh, dispel any myths. <laughs> You know, I was, um, Tatiana, in February, just before things got locked down, I went down to Chechnya, okay? Because I used to work with a guy who was from Chechnya. He went back there a decade ago, and he's been saying, come on, Luke, you travel a lot, come on down. And I went down, and I posted a bunch of photos from, from Grozny. We went across into Ingushetia, and people were like, oh, you know, even Russians were saying to me, you know, are you mad? You know, it's dangerous. I was like, why do you think that? No, it wasn't dangerous. It was safe. It was friendly. Um, but everybody likes to think that everywhere else is dangerous. Yeah, actually, uh, speaking of uh, uh, Chechnya, uh, one of my uh, childhood go uh, girlfriends, she, she went to uh, Chechnya on uh, some kind of uh, uh, work trip. 
um, quite a few months ago. I think it was uh, last summertime. And she told me that everything which is telling it about Chechnya, the perception of it is completely wrong because the people are beautiful, the country is beautiful, and uh, she personally, uh, as the, the tiny little woman, she did not see any threats to herself that would have made her being concerned about her life or safety yeah. or anything like that. Same thing, yeah. I mean, I, you know, we went to Tajikistan a few years back, you know, we went to, I went to Dagestan, I mean, I've been to some weird places. I mean, I've been to North Korea, Sudan, El Salvador, uh, <laughs> you know, um, but uh, um, we still had slavery, it was fine, you know. So um, again, everyone likes to think of it as dangerous and yeah, you can be unlucky. You know, you could get hit by the, the bus walking down the road uh, in any country. So, uh, you know, as I said, that's, that's why I'm a big fan of travel. It opens people's eyes. Brilliant. Okay, guys. Well, thank we you have very to... much, Tatiana. Thank you, yeah, Yuli. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Good to see you again. And uh, John, yeah, I'll send you an email. If I get your, if I get your, you guys, um, these, the, this is just the, the, the pilot, the, the benchmark, mm -hmm. the first edition. Um, been promised another 9,999 editions, um, <laughs> I think in about a week's time. So what I'll do is I'll get your postal addresses and I'll stick one in the mail to you guys, okay? Perfect, yes. Thank I you very do. much, okay, take Thank care. Okay. Oh, yes. okay, bye, bye.